I must start out in this way. Um, let me tell you a little story. Um, I remember I was not doing so well and uh, in high school. In fact, uh, in the 11th grade, I, I failed one semester of the 11th grade. And uh, when I found out I failed, I was so disappointed. I was so upset. And uh, I remember I grabbed some of the books that belonged to my teacher. Don't do this, don't try this. But I grabbed some of the books that belonged to my teacher without her knowledge. And I threw some of her books out of the window. And um, uh, I don't know, I don't remember whether I told her about that, but I did have a time when I called her, when I moved back to Nashville, I called her to invite her uh, for, for lunch together. And we had a great time talking about those years, those high school years. And, uh, but that's, that's part of my story about books. Um, and little did I know that, uh, that I would uh, write a few books. And, and so uh, if you ever see one of my books, uh, don't throw them out the window. Hold on to them and, and read them. I want to um, share with you today because I understand that this is, uh, this is uh, February and this is Black History Month. And I wanna share some things with you about uh, uh, black history, uh, some of the things that I've been thinking about. So at this time, what I would like to do is pray. I, I'm trying to cut the introduction out a little bit uh, because um, uh, the presentation, uh, hopefully it won't be too long. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. And we pray, dear Lord, that what is presented may be a blessing to those who are on Zoom for the Harvest Church. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So I suppose I need to share this screen. So I, if I understand it right, I hit this and then we'll go here. Okay. Okay, can can you all see that? Yes. You can. Okay. I need to move this. Um, yeah. I'm gonna move this here. so that we can make sure. Um, <laughs> the slide. Okay. It's, Boy, I gave it to you. Okay. Just trying to, I wonder if I do this, what the hell? Trying to go to the slideshow. How do you do it so I can? I do have my wife here helping me. I'm trying to get down to the. I need this move so I can. Oh, okay. I see. Well. Um, uh, 
Okay. Okay, I think I think we're there. Can you see that? Yes. You can see that? Okay. So uh, the, the title of this presentation is called The Notion of Dig Dignity, which is also the title of the book that I wrote, The Notion of Dignity. You may understand why as we proceed. So there's a saying that you've heard, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, what does that mean? In short, it means expressions, meanings, and thoughts, and opinions, and actions are, are useless and unimportant if no one ever knows about them. On May 20, on the 25th of May 2020, it did not just change things uh, in the United States for the local community of Minneapolis. It changed the conversation in our nation. It was even bigger than a nationwide conversation. It was pretty much about a global international concern. If you remember, this uh, date was really a huge date. And so we understand that there were many countries that protested against what happened to George Floyd. These are just some of the countries. We could put up three times the amount of countries that you see on the screen. These are the countries that protested because of the George Floyd incident. So I asked myself, and you probably asked yourselves, what was going on here? Why was this such a, an international event or why did so many people respond internationally? Well, an African-American was killed in a way that seemed not to matter, whether he was in the forest or not, but it was as if it was open season. This was in broad daylight that an African-American could be killed and nothing would be done. It was painful. Although we've heard of other killings of, of Blacks and all of them are tragic, this one felt different. I know in my own heart, it felt different. It was a feeling of commonality around the world that something was wrong and that all men should have dignity and should be treated with dignity. Martin Luther King, while in the Birmingham jail wrote this, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I remember uh, Harvest Church when this happened and there was a protest. I knew that I had to be involved. I just, I just had to be involved. And I remember going down uh, town here in Nashville and uh, joined in the protest uh, to, uh, I guess, to show my displeasure of what had happened. More than 60 countries protested against uh, injustice because of the death of George Floyd. It was how he died that grabbed the attention of the whole world. 
So what is dignity? What is dignity? Dignity is the belief that all people hold a special value that is tied to their humanity. That's what dignity is. It is a question of worth. Does human beings have worth? The Bible says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all of the wild animals and over all the all of the creatures that move along the ground. The Bible says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So mankind's worth is the reflection of the creator. It is an intimate relationship by choice with God. Let me say that again. Mankind's worth is his reflection of the creator, an intimate relationship by choice with God. How did Africans and their ancestry become devalued? If this is a question of value, if this is a question of worth, how did African Americans become devalued? Where it seems like it doesn't matter whether it's in the daylight or in the forest that African Americans can be killed. Slave worth is something opposite than the worth that God created us by. Slave worth is the production, mankind's production by force to uh, have those who are slaves to make money or to do uh, uh, other things with slaves. But it is out of production, not a relationship, not a reflection of the creator. You know what the Bible says. So mankind had slaves and slaves were to produce money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil and slavery make no, uh, 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 there's no doubt about it. Slavery was evil and still is evil. Well, how did the tra uh, transatlantic slave trade begin? This is a picture of Henry the Navigator. They also called him Henry, uh, 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 Prince Henry. Henry was from Portugal. Prince Henry gained his reputation by sponsoring many voyages of discovery among the western coast of Africa. In 1441, two of Henry's captains, uh, 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 I'm gonna pronounce his, his last name, of. Uh, uh, Go, go, Clavis, and that may not be wrong, right? And Nuno Tristeo set out for the western coast of Africa. These were voyages to discover some uh, uh, something about this western coast. But here's what's interesting about this: Gosavis' voyage in 1491 is widely considered to be the mark of the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. In 1441, Gosavis was sent by Henry, the navigator from Portugal to explore the Western African coast. 
And by the way, uh, I read something that Henry never went on any of these expeditions. He sent people on these Western, uh, the, of the West Coast of Africa in these ex uh, expeditions under the command of Nuno Tristeo, pronounced uh, Nuno, I'm sorry, Nuno Tristeo, an early Portuguese explorer. So in the 1400s, this is what happened. They explored the continent of Africa. At that time, you know that the greatest power on earth was the Roman Catholic Church. The greatest power on earth was the Roman Catholic Church. In Europe, the church owned one third of the land in Europe. That's a lot of land. They were a powerful, powerful church and they own one third. Not only did they own one third of the land, the Catholic Church owned your soul. You know about purgatory, a place or state of suffering uh, inhabited by the souls of sinners who are atoned for before going to heaven. That's what they said. And you remember they had indulgences was a way to reduce the punishment of those in purgatory. In Europe, most people were Catholics. The priests performed baptism, social services. They could, uh, were the ones that could read the Bible and interpret it. They married you. They heard confessions. The Pope claimed authority over kings in Europe. This particular Pope, Pope Eugene the Fourth, was the Pope in 1441. It was in the 1400s that the transatlantic slave trade started. The Pope Eugene the Fourth gave his support in a papal bull in 1442. Enslaving Africans fell within the limits of a just war. This was extended in an edict of 1942, which gave Portugal the right to enslave captives taken in such a war. So they called it a just war. And the, the, they called it a just war because if you were not Catholic, and you were what they call barbarians or savages, then there could be a war against you to either make you a Catholic or to kill you. That was the case in the early 1400s. You'll see this a little bit more in just a minute. This next Pope, Pope Nicholas V, he also uh, uh, issued some bulls. The West African and West Central Africa, uh, uh, the, uh, the treatment of blacks were addressed in 1452 and 14, I guess it's 50, I can't, 55. When Pope Nicholas V issued a series of papal bulls that granted Portugal the right to enslave sub-Saharan Africans. Church leaders argued that slavery served as a natural deterrent and a Christian, Christianizing influence to barbarous behavior among pagans. So get this, using this logic, the Pope issued a mandate to the Portuguese King Afonso V and instructed him, and these were the instructions. These, this is the Pope's instructions. To invade, search out, 
capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens. And I put this so that you could know what Saracens were. They were dark-skinned Muslims, Arabs. They were people from Syria and North Africa. And so they were to capture them, vanquish them, subdue them, and pagans whatsoever, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to apply and to appropriate to himself and his successors, the kingdoms, dukedoms, counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and to convert them to his and their use and profit. This, my friends, came from a Catholic Pope to do, to bring people to slavery. Now, what you saw earlier was the translation in English. But if there's anybody here that can read Latin, this is the same thing that we just read in Latin. And the Pope gave this order. Now what I want to do, I'm going to take you through um, this um, event that happened at the John Kluge Center at the Library of Congress that was convened, that was a symposium that brought together respected scholars to explore the intricate encounters of Africans, Europeans, and native people during this significant period in America's history. This gentleman, Robert Trent Vinson, uh, spoke at that time. Um, he is a professor of William and Mary. He's, he speaks of slaves likely to have been taken from Central Africa, the Congo, and Ndongo. There was a place called Luanda, which was a Portuguese colony, which Portuguese Catholic missionaries and traders there. Eventually, the Congolese settled with Christianity as its state's religion. So let me share something with you. This colony was the first colony in Africa. The first colony in Africa. And then eventually all of Africa was colonized. But this was the first one in, in Africa for some reason. Let's see, it's not advancing. Let's do it this way. By 1595, the papacy in Rome had declared Congo to be its own episcopal, that is governed by bishops, districts. The Congo, its primary church became its cathedral. Later military units came to Ndongo and Congo areas against Ndongo and Congo to take thousands of slaves, war captives, as it were, to Iberia, Portugal. Portugal established the first colony in Angola in 1575 under European occupation. Now this is very important because the first ships that transported Africans were those from Portugal. The Portuguese dynamic is important here because Angola became the launching point for Portuguese governors to initiate war, specifically to generate war captives. These war captives which they initiated 
would be taken as slaves. So Angolian-based Portuguese merchants held the uh, Asiento contract with Crown to deliver thousands of enslaved people to the Spanish colony. The Asiento was simply a contract to transport slaves. And so they started the war, they had the contract to, uh, to transport slaves, and that is what they did. So this combination, uh, according to uh, of Trent, so this combination of policy, Portuguese policy to engage in a war and a contract, a commercial contract, created a dynamic where warfare was deliberately used to generate war captives and enslaved people. And that's how it happened. I ran across, across something very interesting. Um, I don't have it on the screen, but what I wanna do, I want to play it and I want you to listen to this. It's on my phone. Uh, just this week, Henry Louis Gates did a Finding Your Roots. And he was talking about what happened in North Mexico and Central Mexico. And it is the same thing that I just shared with you, how they were able to subdue the people. And one figure that was involved, a one uh, church that was involved in all of this was the Catholic Church, and he names them. So I want you to listen to this. The said church with which action his majesty was well pleased. So Spain was sending the Roman Catholic Church and conquistadors with guns and superior arms to claim this land for Spain because they had a lot of gold and silver. Right. They used as an excuse the fact that the Native Americans didn't believe in Christianity. And they said, well, these are heathens, they're savages, so we're going to conquer them and Christianize them. We're going to civilize them. Uh, but in civilizing them, quote unquote, kill. it meant killing them, subduing them, converting them, taking them away from their traditional culture. Mm. And they're all rumbled in silver mines. Mm. Could you hear that? What he said was that in North Central, North and Central Mexico, uh, Spain were sending people along with the Catholic Church. And the idea, it was to convert the people, the Indians, those who were there. And if they couldn't convert them, they would kill them. They would kill them because the idea was conquest. And so it is no different than what we have seen uh, here thus far. Luis Mendez D. Vasconcelos was the Portuguese governor in Angola, Angola, Africa. Luis Mendez was bent on conquest to get the number of slaves to nine to 12,000 people a year. In his reign, over 50,000 were exported from Luanda, a Portuguese, a Portuguese capital in Angola, and 150 ships is reported to have left the port of Luanda. 150 ships. Now, in contrast to what we've heard uh, uh, about how African slaves were taken. You know, I remember hearing about, well, the Africans uh, started the wars and they had military against each other and then they sold the slaves. And it may have been the case in some cases, 
But what Vincent is telling us in his uh, research was that these wars were started on purpose, on purpose. And uh, he said it was these military expeditions of the Portuguese with mercenary militaristic Africans known as the Imbagala that drove these chaotic, lawless conditions and slaves were taken. Amazing. In this war context then, and I'm still quoting from Vincent, uh, um, it says, in, in this war context then, slavery became ubiquitous. 1.3 million slaves left from Luanda, we're talking about Angola, that 1.3 million left from that area, which was controlled by the Catholic people and those from Portugal and sent those slaves to various places. Well, where did they go? The destination, most went to Spanish colonies, South America, the Caribbean islands, and later slaves went to United States. And of course, uh, you know, they, uh, the crops were sugar, cotton, indigo. Indigo is a blue color uh, dye and tobacco. And there may be some other things, but, but uh, this is where many of the slaves came from. And then of course, also the rest of the West Coast, many slaves were taken. Now, I'd like to uh, show you, hopefully this will come up. Look at this, this is, this is amazing. This is how the slave trade, how the slaves were taken from Africa starting. You're gonna watch something happen. You see these dots running across? These are slave ships. You can't see it? Oh, I have to share it. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's see if we can do this again. How do we do this? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna try to get this. because this is so important. Okay, if you can bear with me. Bear with me here, technology, technology. Um, okay, I think I hit share screen again and let's see. No, it's not. I'm sorry, you're not gonna be able to see this, it looks like. Um, um, no, I don't think you're gonna be able to, to see this. Okay, now I'm trying to get back to. I'm sorry, okay. You're not gonna be able to see this. For some reason it's not, um, 
it's not going to work. But let me tell you, some of you may have seen this before. Um, so, um, but what it is, it, it showed the, the, um, Yeah, that's not gonna show, okay. Okay, so what what, what it was gonna show, it, uh, the dots would represent those slave ships that was leaving Africa. Uh, you can pull it up on your, um, on your computer. What you will see is all of these little dots leaving Africa going to Brazil and a lot of the islands and then several of them going to um, also uh, the United States. And it is amazing to see so many ships. But uh, Robert Tanney, Robert B. Tanney was the fifth chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. And he was involved in this Dred, uh, Dred Scott decision, uh, if you remember uh, the Dred Scott decision. And he was from one of the prominent families in Maryland who enslaved Africans and the nation's first Catholic Supreme Court uh, justice, speaking of the Declaration of Independence. And this is what he says. Enslaved, the enslaved African race were not intended to be included and form no part of the people who framed and adopted the declaration. In other words, you and I, back then, we were not intended to be a part of this declaration where all men are created equal. Uh, one of the things uh, about um, the, uh, the uh, Catholic Church later on, um, 188 years after 188 years when slaves were sold for economic development in the nation's capital, Brown uh, writes this, in 2016, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. offered a public apology after acknowledging that 188 years prior, Ezrit Priest sold 272 slaves to save the school from financial ruin. This is something that I just learned about recently. And maybe some of you already knew about that, but, uh, but they gave a public apology because they had sold 272 slaves to save them from financial ruin. This is how the New York Times first reported the story. The human cargo was loaded on ships at the bustling wharf in the nation's capital, destined for the plantations of the deep south. Some slaves pleaded for rosaries as they were rounded up praying for deliverance. But on that day, in the fall of 1838, no one was spared. Not the two month old baby and her mother, not the field hands, not the shoemaker, and not Cornelius Hawkins, who was about 13 years old when he was forced on board. Their panic and desperation would be mostly forgotten for more than a century. But this was no ordinary slave sale. The enslaved African Americans had belonged to the nation's most prominent Jesuit priests, and they were sold, along with scores of others, to help secure the future of the premier Catholic institution of higher learning at that time, known today as Georgetown University.
That is amazing. That is amazing. Ellen White says, and we're about to close. She says, in this land of light, a system is cherished, cherished, which allows one portion of the human family to enslave another portion, degrading millions of human beings to the level of brute creation. The equal of this sin is not to be found in heathen lands. That's what she said. That's what she said. My last slide here says, God spoke concerning the captivity. This is by Ellen White. God spoke concerning the captivity of the colored people as verily as he did concerning the Hebrew captives and said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people and I am come down to deliver them. That's what God thought about slavery. And so that's my presentation this morning to let you know how slavery, the transatlantic slavery started Many people don't know that the Catholic Church did a lot of things and they hid their they hid their hand, but they were involved in the very beginning, not only in Africa, but also in uh, uh, Mexico. Uh, and the only reason they didn't have such a bigger, larger footprint in the United States was something that happened in the 1500s. And that was Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation. And in America, there were people, there were lots of Protestants that were coming over here and uh, the Catholic Church uh, was not as big. They didn't have a larger footprint uh, here. Um, and, uh, and so uh, there were people who rebelled against them and God, God helped to deliver us uh, from slavery. He did it. He did it. And uh, that's our presentation for this morning. I wish I could show you uh, the clip of the uh, slave trade, but it's not, uh, it's not working. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for you had us in mind. And eventually slavery would be over in this country. Thank you so much, dear Lord, Thank you for raising up this church because we have a special message to proclaim to others. And we ask dear Lord that you will give us the wisdom and the know-how to do so. We pray this prayer in Jesus name, amen.